Thank you again for that lovely music, lovely song. The presence of our Jesus with us is a very comforting thought. I wish my brother that this podium will not be a see-through podium. And I'm glad that this is now the fourth day that I'm speaking to you because at least I will not be as nervous as I was during the first day. If during the first day this was the hope that was there, you probably would be seeing my knees shaking. But because this is not the fourth day, I'm still nervous. Don't get me wrong. Not because you have been a preacher, are a preacher, and will continue to preach, you lose that stage fright. I know, I cannot get over that. So, I'm asking that as I preach, that you will pray for me. And that we'll pray together as we seek the Lord's presence in our midst. Heavenly Lord, dear Jesus, Thank you so much for the privilege of knowing you. Thank you for the opportunity that you gave us that we can come together and study more of you. We only ask, Lord, that your grace will sustain us, that your mercies will lead us to a closer understanding of you and your will for us. So speak to us today, and may your spirit Fill us in your more, most powerful and lovely name, we ask. Amen. The title we have for today's message is Playing the Game. Playfulness is associated usually with childhood days. In fact, Childhood and playing games are almost synonymous with each other. Hide and seek, hopscotch, Chinese jump rope, follow the leader, Dutch ball, kickball, marble, stick tactile, Simon says, leapfrog. You can go on and on and on. Games children play. We play, we play those games as children, and we, we don't forget those games, especially those games where we got beat by a smaller player or we got caught by somebody we do not like and we have to sit down or just be an onlooker as a penalty for being caught at times we mark our childhood days either great or boring depending on the number of games we played or by the number of times we got caught by a favorite playmate it will surprise you to know that in the New Testament there is a game children played which Jesus took note of. It was called weddings and funerals. Have you heard of that? Yes? Let me see the hands of those who heard that. Yes, two of us. We're blessed. Weddings and funerals. They're played by children. When they shout weddings, participants were supposed to sing and dance and keep on dancing and singing until they hear the shout, funerals! And what do you do? You wail and wear a dumber face and don a downcast look. Jesus mentioned the game weddings and funerals to describe the generation of his day in some ways. Weddings and funerals could also be used to characterize people of our days, of our generation. Here is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19. He asked, But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children 
sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned for you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutinous man, and a wine bibber, a friend of, of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. <coughs> it looks like a parable to me, and it is. John the Baptist had a problem. Big, big problem. He could not make out who really Jesus was. Yeah, he baptized Jesus in the Jordan. Even called him one time the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But in the darkness of the dungeon where he was thrown into, he began to have doubts on the identity of Jesus. So, he sent out two of his disciples to get the answers from the horse's mouth, so to speak. You remember that one time, John had to rebuke Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee for his marital affairs. You know what happened to Herod, huh? Antipas visited his brother in Rome and seduced his wife. He had then divorced his own wife and lured his sister-in-law to leave her husband and marry him. John the Baptist denounced that behavior and paid dearly the penalty for that denunciation. He was sent to rot in the prison fortress of Machaerus in the burning mountains by the Dead Sea. It is not surprising that within the confines of his torture chamber, or whatever you may call it, questions and doubts about who Jesus really was began to form in his mind. He was not so sure now if Jesus was the Messiah. Because when he started to preach, and he started to introduce Jesus to the people, he was telling the people, that the axe, that the axe would be brought to the root of the trees. He once prophesied what the Messiah would do. And he was so enthusiastic. He was expecting so much from Jesus. He was expecting that Jesus would lead a march of people, maybe soldiers who would free them from Roman subordination. And yet, on the other hand, everything tends to get out of proportion when you are suffering for, for a long time in a confined space, as John was in Matthäus. How many of you, since you were born again, entertaining doubts about God and in the way God has been letting you. How many of you entertain doubts about your place in the Lord's work? I have to be honest with you. Doubts also came into my mind many times. But I had to fight those demons. I had to struggle. And John was probably in the same place, in the same situation. But wisely, John did not allow his plight to play on his mind. And to dispel his doubts, he sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus what really was the score. Well, Jesus bids just disciple to go and tell John what they hear and see. 
And what was it that they heard and saw? The blind received their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the good news is preached to the poor. Jesus said, Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. 11.4 following. After saying that to the disciples of John, Jesus was full of praises for John, calling him a prophet, the messenger that was built to come and usher in the coming of the Lord. Jesus, of course, was echoing the words of Malachi chapter 3, 1. Before the great day of the coming of the Lord, there is a messenger that was to come to introduce the way of the Lord. And guess who followed? John the Baptist. Well, let's go back to Malachi first. In Malachi, the expected coming one was God Almighty, and they were thinking that it would be Elijah who would come in the New Testament. John was that sort of Elijah who announced the coming of the Lord. Who followed him? It was Jesus who followed John. It was Jesus who brought that divine presence in the midst of the people. And on and on, Jesus went to describe John. Jesus declared that as a prophet, nobody is greater than John the Baptist. His greatness is due to his proximity to Jesus. I've been asking myself the question, what made John so great? Was he greater than Moses? Was he greater than Daniel? Was he greater than Elijah? To the Jews, there is no greater prophet than Moses. They were looking for the arrival of Moses. And when you go to the book of Acts, you find that Moses is extolled in the book of Acts. Because he was the prophet that was to appear in the last days. He was the prophet who would bring his people, God's people, into an understanding of the Messiah as he leads his people into the glories of the kingdom. Was John greater than Moses? Jesus said so. He was the greatest of the prophet. But I would like to think that the greatness of John was due to his proximity to Jesus. But as great as John was, Jesus said that he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. John's Doubts and hesitations show that great man as he was, he was not yet quite in the kingdom, for he remained unclear as to the person of the king. Who was the king? Jesus, of course. When you are in the kingdom, committed with single minded devotion to the king, you are even closer to the king than John was. At least, that appears to be the logic of the words of Jesus. The thing, the main thing, is the kingdom. Don't miss out on the kingdom. The greatness of John, the greatness of Moses, the greatness of Elijah. Don't miss out on the kingdom. From the days of John's preaching until now, people have been grasping for the kingdom, pressing their way into the kingdom. By the way, you should not forget that when Jesus came into the picture and when John the Baptist came into the picture, there was a time, or that was a time of unparalleled religious fervor in Israel. People were studying the Bible. The scriptures were studying the Bible and they felt and they knew from their studies that the Messiah would soon appear. 
that also explains the presence of the three wise men who came to Jerusalem, seeking, looking for the Messiah. John's preaching had proved to be the signal for this invasion of the kingdom, but he could not see the kingdom coming because he had been thrown into prison. Whether he could see it or not, John the Baptist, let me tell you this, was the watershed in God's revelation. He was the messenger of the Lord sent to prepare the way of the coming king. He was the fulfillment of Old Testament expectation. Having said that, however, the quality of this man stood out in stark contrast to his hearers, especially to the leaders of his day. One of the things that you will notice that frequently characterized the response of people to the message of John, to the message of Jesus, to the message of the disciples of Jesus, was this one thing very inexplicable. They've been studying the arrival of the Messiah. They've been expecting the coming of the Messiah, but when, they, when the Messiah came, they rejected him. Nothing is ever twist to their liking when it comes to Jesus. They resemble, the leader especially, they resemble petulant children. And if you will go through the details of the New Testament, from the Gospels to the Book of Acts, you'll find out that one big reason why Israel as a nation rejected Jesus was because leadership rejected Jesus. I have come to know, I have come to experience, I have also come to observe that many of those who come to the seminary here would one day assume very, very important leadership decisions or positions. I was uh, very surprised to find out that one of my students here, when I was here, uh, was just like myself when I was the executive secretary of the union, Brother Bindu Salam, was the executive secretary of uh, his, like his territory in Indonesia. I was so happy to hear that, to know that. Sometimes we see ourselves as up here, when another time you see yourself as equal. I like that. At the foot of the cross, the ground is equal. Ground is level. But I'm saying this because you who are here today, you cannot live out in rejecting Jesus. Because as leaders, your responsibility to God is greater than the responsibility of the people below you. Israel as a nation, the Jews as a people, rejected the Messiah, rejected Jesus because the leaders rejected Jesus. I'll speak more on this in a little while. But the leadership of the times of Jesus were determined to harden their hearts. And I think anybody for that matter, when you are determined to harden your heart, you will come up with all kinds of excuses in connection with the kingdom beckoning you. In connection with the desire of Jesus for you to follow him. In many ways. John the Baptist experienced rejection because the leaders and 
that many people hardened their hearts and did not listen to him. In the game of weddings and funerals, John acted the funeral, funeral part. He came preaching the message of repentance, and not very many believed in him, although his ministry lasted not as long as Jesus' ministry, John was. not really accepted by those who heard him. But he was accepted by no less than the king of the kingdom, Jesus himself. And when you consider to, to look at John, try to analyze his person, his lifestyle, you'll find John to be a very, very strange fellow. He was eating very, very meager food. He was using the minimum of clothing. He was relentless in pointing out the need to return to God and repent. He was great, however, because he moved the nation as nobody has done for centuries. He brought people into an understanding of the coming one. So when he sent messengers to Jesus to inquire about Jesus' real identity, how did Jesus respond? Two ways. Two ways. Firstly, John is told to look into the fulfillment of the scripture. Matthew 11, 5 says this of Jesus' response. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the, thing, the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. These were the things that Jesus was doing. Things which Old Testament scripture, especially the book of Isaiah, declared to the Jews. Jesus was in effect fulfilling the scriptures. And if the arrival of Jesus fulfilled the scriptures, then he must be the Messiah anticipated by the Old Testament. Here is the very strong stress on his scriptural fulfillment. If Jesus is the fulfillment, then he cannot be the contradiction of that fulfillment. If Jesus was the fulfillment of scripture, then he must be the revelation of God. So Jesus tells John's messengers that he is the one for whom or to whom John looked. Secondly, John is told of the mighty works of Jesus. The works of Jesus indicate the powerful breaking in of the kingdom of God. In Jesus, the kingdom of God has broken into the rim of history. You know, this is one of the ways by which or in which scientific minds do not agree with biblical revelation. Because the scientific mind would always look for proof would always look for objectivity. We are living within history. And it is impossible for scientific minds to grasp somebody outside of history coming in to history. You follow what I'm saying? We live within history. And if there is something that is outside of history that comes into our Sphere. That is unexplainable. That is incomprehensible to the scientific mind. But Jesus in his person indicated that yes, the kingdom of God has entered, has broken into the realm of history. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus came up with a very graphic illustration which I'd like to pose as a question to you. When Jesus was here on earth, did he cast out demons and evil spirits from people? I'm asking you that question. When Jesus was here on earth, did he cast out demons from people possessed by them? Yes! Yes, he did! Did he exorcise demons and malevolent spirits out of those possessed? Yes! Yes, he did! 
in Luke 11, 20. If our answer is yes, then we are affirming with Jesus that the kingdom of heaven has come in his person because Jesus is there plainly saying that if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. This one single declaration of Jesus is that declaration that tells us that the kingdom of God has really come in his person. Problem is, his detractors would not want to listen to Jesus. As they did not listen to John the Baptist, they would also not listen to Jesus. When we go back to Matthew 11, with the children's game of weddings and funerals, we can see that in spite of God's kingdom having come in the person of Jesus, the generation of his day did not respond either to John the Baptist or to Jesus' message or person or work. This unresponsiveness led Jesus to condemn, castigate, say stinging words to the people of those days. John came. They rejected him. Jesus came. They rejected him as well. John showed himself to the people attired in very meager clothing. His countenance like that of people going to funerals. This message was serious. Jesus, he came, he did not exactly came in the manner of John the Baptist, but Jesus spent time with people eating, drinking with them, associating with what you may want to call sinners. And this is the background of that parable that we mentioned in Matthew chapter 11. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, We play the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourn to you, and you did not lament. Jesus, through this, is telling his listeners, the people of his day, John came! John came with a seriousness that we are supposed to receive his words, but you did not receive it. He came mourning, but you did not lament. I came making merry with sinners, you should have been happy with my associating with sinners, but you did not show yourself happy. Instead, you condemned, and instead of being happy, you rejected. Verse 18, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. No matter what you do, people who are not bent on entering the kingdom of heaven in the mind of Jesus, no matter what you do, if people will not, will, will not be willing to understand or to accept or to listen to the message, nothing will help them or nothing will lead them. to accepting the voice of God. 
But you know, Jesus is serious in what he was saying. He was serious about the kingdom of heaven and I find it strange that very many people during those times, in spite of what they saw, Jesus did, they were just like playing games. Oh, they took on the form of religion, come to church at the Sabbath, read the scriptures, sing when it's time to sing, pray when it's time to pray. But what is in their heart? Could it also be that this same situation exists in the people of God today. We come to church, we come to week of prayer meetings, we sit on the pews, on the chairs, we sing, we pray. Outward forms of religiosity. What is in your heart? Look, no. the faith of Jesus, the religion of Jesus, the life that Jesus is offering to you is a life that he is very, very, very seriously offering to you. You cannot afford to play games. I cannot afford to play games because the kingdom of God is not about playing games. Little Tommy was doing very, very badly in math. His parents tried everything, flashcards, special learning centers, in short, everything they could think of. Finally, in a last ditch effort, they took Tommy down and enrolled him in a local Christian school. After the first day, little Tommy comes home with a very, very serious look on his face. He doesn't kiss his mother hello. Instead, he went straight into his room and started studying. Books and papers are spread out all over the room and little Tommy is hard at work. His mother is amazed. She calls him down to dinner and she was shocked. The minute he is done, he marches back to his room without a word and in no time he is back hitting the books as hard as before. This goes on for some time day after day, while the mother tries to understand what made all the difference. Finally, little Tony <coughs> brings home his report card. He quietly lays it on the table, goes up to his room, and hits the books. With great fear, his mother took the report card. And to her surprise, little Tommy got an A in math. She could no longer hold her curiosity. She goes to his room and says, Son, what was it? Was it the Christian teachers? Little, little Tommy looks at her and shakes his head. Well then, she replies, was it the books, the discipline, the structure, the uniforms? What was it? Little Tommy looks up at her and says, well, on the first day of the school, when I saw that guy nailed to something like a plus sign, I knew they weren't fooling around. To look unto Jesus, he wasn't fooling around when he died on that cross. He wasn't fooling around when he gave up his life so that you and I can enter into the glories of that kingdom. We cannot afford to play games. Let's take it with a grain of salt. We are leaders.
Or one way or the other, sooner or later, those of you who are not leaders will probably be occupying posts and positions of leadership. There is such a great need for us as leaders to lead the people of God into accepting Jesus and fully, truly accepting, sincerely accepting Jesus. Sometimes by the way we talk, by the way we associate with our people, even by the way we eat, we are telling people, oh, this is just your love. I know there are many on the church today who just while while away their time. They don't have anything better to do. They cannot get out of the church because nobody would hire them. So just stick to being a pastor. No. Jesus is serious about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is serious about us getting into the glorious kingdom. And I tell you, Jesus is calling you now, today, to look, in, look into your lives and examine your life if really you are serious in entering into that kingdom as Jesus was serious in dying on the cross. Jesus calls you. I don't know who you are, but Jesus knows who you are. I don't know what your past is. Jesus knows your past. I don't know the challenges that you face, but Jesus does know your challenges. He is calling you to live your life of commitment to Him. He is calling you to be consistent, to be constant in the way you follow Him. Remember, this is why I said, the spirituality of the church will never rise higher than its leaders. If you want your church, if you want the members of your church to study more of Jesus, to live more like Jesus as a leader, live your life as Jesus would want you to live your life. The kingdom beckons. Jesus calls for you. He wants you to enter the glories of that kingdom. Jesus soon is coming. He is really coming very, very soon. When he comes, he will be very happy to see you leading your church, your group, to march into that kingdom. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will so overcome us, that your spirit will so overpower us, so that we may realize our situation. You're not playing games with us as you did not play games when Jesus died on the cross. Oh, Father, please help us to truly be serious about this business of the kingdom. Lead us to do your will. Give us an understanding of the things that are involved in the death of Jesus on the cross. And lead us too, Father, that as we lead your people, we may draw them to an ever greater understanding of what it meant for Jesus to die on that cross. Friends, please, please, from all of our sins, and be with us just for today. Thank you, Father, for that kingdom, for that kingdom that calls us. Be with us, I pray. In Jesus' name.